Um, well, welcome um, to the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association, to the library. This is really one of the best rooms in Portland, I think. Um, if for anyone who doesn't already know, I want to be sure and point out that it's an active card catalog. So if you're nostalgic for looking stuff up and actually want it to work, this is a great place for that. Um, use of the library, lending is one of the privileges of membership. Um, if people aren't members already, this becomes free if you are a member. Other programming that we do also is free and a part of the deal. The Main Charitable Mechanics Association is a neat place. It's been here since 1815. Um, this building was built by members of the association in 1857. Yes, wow, exactly so. Um, and from the beginning, um, the MCMA has been an organization of makers for makers. Um, and it still is that way. So obviously there's been a transformation since the days when Coopers and Buggy Whip Makers made up the membership, but the maker community here in Maine is really robust and fascinating, and so those are starting to be, this is starting to be a, one of the places where makers can get together, meet each other, um, and this is one of the, the venues in which that happens at the Makers at the Hall um, lecture series. So obviously the last Wednesday of every month, we're here, we invite in um, one at a time some of the extraordinary makers who live and work here and have them share with us what they do, why they do what they do. Um, it's also a chance for, for y'all to meet each other, to meet and chat with um, the folks who are speaking. Um, the what sort of structure of the evening, I'll get done in a moment. Um, I'll introduce our speaker. We'll He'll do his thing, there'll be a little time for Q&A, there's wine and cake for continuing the conversation in an informal way beyond that. And Carolyn has just let me know if there's been some interest expressed in seeing the rest of the building, but in particular the ballroom, and she'd be happy to take anybody who's interested um, upstairs to see that once, once things fall down in here. So, without further ado, um, this is Bennett Steele, a landscape gardener and woodworker. Um, from Falmouth, now in Yarmouth, in an extraordinary sounding 1860 farmhouse, timber frame with a crazy big barn. Um, and I won't say any more than that because he's here to do that. So, done Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you guys all for coming tonight, taking your time to come learn about what I'm up to. Um, my company, I actually have two businesses, um, they're really intertwined together. It's Wheelwright Landscapes and Wheelwright Woodworks. Um, the reason why I chose the name is because I was given that name uh, as my middle name. And I really like circles and I thought it kind of made sense to me to use it. And hence, I am Wheelwright and my logo is the flower of life. And I definitely draw a lot of inspiration from sacred geometry and the flower of life um, pretty much makes up everything that we are and everything around us. So it's pretty interesting uh, logo. Uh, I actually traded pruning work in exchange for the logo. So it was a nice exchange. Go ahead. Um, this is actually a picture of the first gardens I built. And these were for myself. Um, as you can see, I, I really like the circle patterns. Um, at the time, I was studying permaculture. Um, Bill Mollison has wrote, wrote a lot about permaculture. And I, I bought his book, The Designer's Manual. I would highly recommend you guys look into that if you haven't already uh, looked into it. It's, it's really a beautiful book. In his book, he talks about natural patterns, patterns found in nature. And he talks a lot about the, the Fibonacci spiral and obviously mandala shapes are common in a lot of cultures. And so I wanted to build a mandala garden. So I built the mandala garden first. And then in the years to follow, I added the two other gardens um, to it. So you can go ahead and click it. So as you can see, it's sort of cool from the top. And, you know, it's funny because the garden on the right actually you know, I, I like to watch History Channel, so I've, I've actually started to, to look at 
this shape and it looks a lot like Atlantis to me, the lost city. And I thought it was kind of weird that I kind of created that garden just out of the plain function of it. I wasn't trying to, to actually make that shape. I just wanted to lay out a shape that was efficient. And the beds on the outside are four foot. The paths are two foot. The beds on the, on the inside are four foot. So you have a two foot path with a four foot garden bed and then a four foot circle in the middle so you can reach everything from every side. And when you lay it out that way, it turns into this really cool shape. Um, so a lot of times when I do my design work, I'm often letting the form of it follow the function. So it's all about function for me, not high tech, pretty stuff. Although I really like, as you will see in the following slides, things to be quite pretty, because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make the world a prettier place. You go ahead and click to the next slide. This was actually the neighbors of mine at the time, and they used to walk their dog, and they would always look through in and see my gardens, and one day, she came, she's actually, was, she's a surgeon in Portland. She came by and said, hey, uh, do, you, do you do gardens? And I said, no, but if you want me to do one for you, I'd be more than happy to. So she said, yeah, we'd love it if you'd build us a garden. We really love yours. So this is what I was working with, and um, I transformed it into this. And this was sort of the early phases of me bringing wood, wood into the landscape projects that I did. So I built these cedar, cedar beds for her, and about three years later came in and built those two trellises for her after because I had done some other ones that she really liked and she wanted those too. So it's nice when you can talk people into doing fun stuff and that was kind of the case here. And I did some other stuff for them as well. Um, this was another project that I did that incorporated wood in the landscape. Um, this was for a lady that lives off of Eagle's Nest Road in Scarborough. And she really was particular about how much she loved her birds and she, she lives on Eagle's Nest Road, so, you know, I figured I wanted to do something that was sort of like birdsy a little bit, and I drew from that inspiration, and I, I tried to create something with wood that resembled a nest. And these are some of the materials that I used. I actually, at the time, I really didn't, hadn't, I'd never done it before. I, I Googled... Uh, waddling. This is actually a waddle garden that I built. And I, we didn't have any sources of willow, which is what typically they use for waddle work in Europe. So I was looking for straight pieces of wood. And really the only thing that I could find was this apple sucker wood. And I had, had the idea that I would just go around and prune apples for people and take the wood and make this garden. And I didn't really know what I was getting into and this was one load and I think it took like about 10 of those loads to build this garden and I got to the point where I was literally driving around looking for apple wood because I couldn't find it anywhere I, I burned through all the places that I knew had it and <laughs> it went into the winter where I was still working on it looking for wood but uh, these, these are really nice pieces I, I was calling these dream weavers you can go ahead and click it to the next one. And this is what I was looking for. So I was driving around neighborhoods and I was looking for apples that hadn't been pruned in 10 years. And these are what they call water spouts in apples and they're the, the suckers that, that shoot up. And when you prune an apple, you really want to take all of those out. So this particular tree was a, an, a, a couple of older folks that lived up in Sabatis and I stopped by and said, hey, I really think your apples could use a pruning, and I would do it in exchange for the wood. And they said, you must be sent from heaven because we, we've been wanting to prune these trees for years, and we just can't afford to do it. And I said, well, it's your lucky day. So I pruned all the apples on their property and was very happy to do so. And I, I honestly thought that this was going to finish my project off, but it didn't. Go ahead and click to the next one. So I had the, I had the bright idea that if I took the bark off the wood, it would last longer. So we, we started peeling it. 
And my brother Josh got involved, my sister got involved, everybody got involved, and we peeled and peeled and peeled. And finally I realized that I wasn't going to be able to peel every twig. So I did a little section where I blended it in. And it, it looked pretty nice, but uh, I pretty much gave up on the peeling idea. Um, so this is the garden in, in bloom. And it really it, it worked out quite nice, actually, the, the way the, the wattle held the plants up. It was like, sort of like a little cradle for the plants. Um, you know, the squash really liked it, as you can see. Go ahead and click to the next one. And, you know, I, I got these posts from a friend of mine. They were some old, uh, it was a, a dead cedar snag that I wanted to use for the entrance. And then I built a, a trellis for them as well. So after experiencing the wattle garden made out of apple, I started to realize that that wasn't really all that sustainable because after like three years, it started to like disintegrate a little bit. I did give my client a uh, forewarning that it was probably not gonna last all that long, but she said, D don't worry about it, we're 85. We just want something to enjoy right now. I said, perfect, sounds good to me. But I wanted to find a way to do something like that with something that was going to last a long time. And my love of black locust, which is the wood I use for this, led me to doing this type of wattle fence. Um, this is made with black locust that I took. And I, I actually started with rough sewn black locust boards that I got from a, a gentleman in uh, Sheffield, Massachusetts, because I couldn't find any black locust around here. No one sells it that, that, that I was aware of. So I, I drove all the way down there, filled up my trailer with some black locust, and started ripping it into 3 8 inch strips. And me being the uh, perfectionist, or at least try to be as, as perfect as possible, and that's sort of my objective in life, <laughs> I decided I was going to round each piece. So I routed all four sides of these pieces all the posts rounded everything i wanted it to be nice and soft so about four thousand strips times four you know you're talking quite a few uh passes through the old router so i got my workout for sure and i went through a few blades but uh it really did come out quite beautiful and i was really happy with it and, it, and it's been now four years and it's still looking really nice as well as the locust fence, I made the hand-woven trellis, which is sort of a staple of my uh, edible artscape projects that I make. I like, to, I like to use the vertical space as much as possible. And instead of buying a panel and slapping it in, I, I actually make these um, by hand. I, it's actually pretty quick now, but um, it, it, it's a little time consuming. <laughs> This was the gate I made for the fence. And this was actually thinner strips that I steamed. I had to steam them to make, because the gate's actually a, a three foot wide gate. So, and I have, you know, one, two, three, four posts technically. So it's a tight weave. So in order to do it without the pieces breaking, I had to steam them. So this was the first attempt I had at steam bending wood and making something with it. And it worked out really nice and it's a really a really pretty pretty gate. Is there a time constraint on how long the wood stays pliable after you steam it? Or? You know, I, that's a good question, but I would imagine as soon as it starts to cool off and lose moisture, it would probably be less flexible. Um, I really didn't have any experience at all with it. I actually did what I always do. I went to Google and yeah. how do you steam bend wood you know I made a little box to do it and um, there it was it actually worked beautifully it was really easy because you know really the hardest part was getting the nails on the ends and getting them flat you know and it worked out really nice and none of them have popped in three years so the jury's still out on it you know that's that's how I I usually learn the hard way but going back over the years and seeing the work and seeing how it performs in the field it sort of makes me a little bit wiser and i change accordingly change my techniques you can go ahead and click to the next one 
This was another uh, wood project in my landscape business. You know, just a little blurb about my, me. You know, I, I do the woodworking because I love it. I'm passionate about it. It's not something that I've done to make money. Um, actually, I haven't even sold one of my pieces. I do it because I love it. And really, the landscaping is my primary business. And that's where I make a living. And so anyway, I was making this black locust garden um, out, of, out of wood that I got down in Sheffield, Mass. as well. Um, black locust benches. I made a nice black locust uh, arbor trellis um, with through tenons. So, you know, I, I learned a lot through this, which sort of catapulted me into the interest of making furniture. So this is sort of a progression of my learning and experimenting. <laughs> These are applewood tomato towers that I made. And, uh, you know, the, again, the applewood isn't all that durable over the long haul. It looks beautiful right when you make it like this, but it, they, they, set, they really dry out fast. And these probably aren't even in service anymore. So I started to change my design philosophies and use different materials. It, this was sort of the first phase, which was cedar. This was a garden I did with a friend of mine in New Jersey that we co-designed co and built. Um, it's, it was a garden in Rumps in New Jersey. You can go ahead and click to the next one. And then this was the next phase for me, which was making it out of black locust, which for anybody that's, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with black locust. It's a wood that's native to the, like the Appalachian mountain range. Um, it's not a native here, but it's, it's found a lot in this area because back in the early 1800s when people were moving um, to Maine and New England to farm, they clear, oftentimes clear cut the entire forest and they didn't have any shade trees because if they left a tree, it would often get blown over because it was suddenly exposed to the elements. So they wanted a fast growing tree to put near the house to provide shade and also to act as like a lightning rod so that the tree would get struck, not the house. So people started to plant a lot of black locust trees on farms, which is where you find a lot of them now, um, for that reason. Black locust is the most durable wood in North America. It's extremely high in silica content. Uh, they used it in colonial Williamsburg for the early structures there. And they went back 100 years later and the posts were still totally intact. So it's really extremely rot resistant. It's sort of like a tropical hardwood that grows here. It's also um, a tree that spreads rapidly and quickly and it's, it, it tends to outreach its intended area of planting. So it's on the invasive species uh, list here in Maine now. And you'll find a lot of black locust often is, has companion plants like uh, bittersweet, you know, barberry, um, other invasives, they all sort of tend to cluster together. And the black locust is strong enough to support the vines and the weight of the vines. And they're really burly looking. You'll, You'll see them along the road, along the highways. The highway department planted them extensively because they're really good at stabilizing steep slopes because of their rhizomatous behavior. <laughs> but um, so I continued with the black locust. The design that I had in the three earlier phases, when I started to want to move the tomato cages around the garden, and I would try to pull them out of the ground, the nails would shift, so then they would rack. So then I could, you know, I'd putting them into the new spot, you know, I'm, I want things to be pretty much real square and level, and they were getting knocked out of level. So then I came up with this, this is the current design, with through tenons on all the cross pieces so it can't rack. And then I used um, the poly twine that I use on the, on the woven trellises just to make it a little lighter too. 
So this is, these have been out for two years, like in their second season now. So, so far so good. You can pull them right up and they're not racking and so far so good. This is another example of <coughs> using wood in my landscape projects. This is, this is a project I did for some people up in Wayne, Maine. And they wanted me to build them a vegetable garden. And you can see the tomato towers in the background there and the other trellises over on the left. And I talked them into doing a worm bin. And they said, sure, let's do it. And I said, oh, wonderful. So this is a, this is a worm bin that uh, is recessed two feet into the ground. And I dug a three foot hole and put about a foot of crushed stone under it and then set the granite. And uh, after four years, the worms are still thriving. And this was an experiment because I had never heard of anybody doing it in Maine because of the cold temperatures. But I figured if I went three feet deep, there wasn't going to be much frost that deep. And the worms could migrate down in the winter and come back up in the spring. And the, 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 they're really thriving. Go ahead and click to the next one. You can see this, see how it opens up. But it also is like a, a deck. You can walk right across it. So it's sort of like part of the patio, but I really like this. I was actually just up there the other day because I maintain the, the gardens for them still. And everything's really nice. And this is a really nice system if you do want to compost and you want no smell and you have a little space outside your kitchen door and this is a wonderful way to compost. It's really low maintenance. Fourth year and we still haven't emptied it. It's three feet by five feet in, in dimensions. So. so where do I get my black locust? That's, <clears throat> I got a little bit tired of driving all over New England looking for it. And after searching high and low, I had, no one was selling it in Maine. And, and Finally, I started to think about it, and I started to call arborists. And I said, this black locust everywhere. I see it everywhere. And I s started to drive around, and sure enough, I saw five logs on the side of the road on Route 88. And I left a note on them and said, I would be really interested in these logs. Please call me. And I got a call back, and that was where it all started. And then I was lucky enough to get the possession of this tree, which is a tree that was growing on Main Street in Freeport. It was an 1860s inn, the Kendall Tavern Inn in downtown Freeport. And the gentleman that owns the inn didn't want the tree to go to firewood. And he was looking for someone like me, an artist, to utilize the wood to make beautiful things out of. So I found him online and I agreed to make him a table in return for the wood and pay for it to be trucked to my house and that's what I did and I sawed this wood up and it's drying now and I'll be making some nice pieces out of it in the coming years. I also find wood in my landscaping work when storms roll through like the storm we had last I think it was October we had that big blow and this beautiful curly maple tree got blown down. It was actually at one of my clients' house and it had to be taken down. So I was able to salvage some really nice pieces from this tree as well. And I'll be making some stuff out of this in the future. But it's usually the storm damage that creates the flow of wood for me. You know, when this, and a lot of this really big wood that you'll see that's damaged in these storms, oftentimes we'll just go to the landfill because it's too big for people to process into firewood and it's much too big for the mills to make lumber out of because they don't have throats big enough to fit these logs into their um, saws. So it's an opportunity and I've sort of jumped on it. I ended up uh, buying a chainsaw mill with a 54 inch cutting capacity. So I can cut pretty much anything that Maine can throw at me. This is a log that I was lucky enough to get from Lucas Tree Service. I was driving down the road and I saw the log in the back of their truck. And I said, oh my God, look at those logs. 
And I, you know, I just followed this guy right back to his yard. And then I went in there and I said, what are you guys doing with this wood? And he's like, he goes, well, it's probably going to end up going to Biddeford to the dump. That's, we, we don't want to, we can't do anything with it. So <clears throat> in my other lifetime, I was a golf pro. And I worked for a season at Portland Country Club. And I remembered that the owner of Lucas Tree Service is a member at Portland Country Club. He might remember me. So I wrote him an email and said I was interested in these pin oak logs. And he said, they're all yours. Have fun. So I was lucky enough to get this, this beautiful log from them. It's about 52 inches on one side in diameter and about 46 on the small side, this side. And if you look at the, the size of the, the tire, I mean, it's, it's a monster. So I've sawn this up and it's all in slabs now. So this will make some beautiful dining room tables. And this is, this is, how, I saw, this is how I saw it up. I saw it up with a double double powered Alaskan chainsaw mill that two people operate and it's it's not for the light of heart even though Victor makes it look pretty easy it's uh it's it's not easy work and it's it's a little scary when you're making those first cuts at head high and you know you're thinking to yourself is this my day because if that chain comes off you know it's going to come right at your uh, head so lucky nothing's happened but you know uh, we try to be careful with it. Victor is an old schooler, so he, he doesn't like all the protective gear. He says he likes to hear the saws running. I said, okay. Uh, this is trimming the pin oak to length. And that's a four foot bar. This is actually one of Lucas Tree Service's top arborists. And he, he, he was the one that cut the tree. He said it was the biggest pin oak cut in Maine. And I said, oh, interesting. He said, I'd really like to get a couple pieces of it. And I said, no problem. What do you want? He said, I want a couple cookie slices. I said, you go ahead and have at it. So he came over before we milled it and cut some cookie slices. And then I actually gave him a, a, a couple of nice slabs out of it too. I thought he deserved it. The other way that I find the wood is online. And this was... Um, black walnut that came from uh, Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey. So I found a guy that was selling some of it in New Jersey and I went down and got some. And he also, he also sold me some black locusts because he had some. This was before I had my own source locally. So I was lucky enough to get my hands on some of that. And you're gonna see in the future pictures a table I made out of one of these slabs. So, in order to make furniture out of these pieces of wood, you have to make them flat. And when you're dealing with pieces of this awkward size and shape, <clears throat> oftentimes people around don't have planers wide enough to handle these types of pieces of wood. So I use a router, a hand router, to flatten them. And that's a router jig. So you have to go over it. It's a slow process, <clears throat> but it's very precise. It also sort of leaves a rough texture to it, so it takes a lot of sanding to get it out. It's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it, but it works, and it's low tech. And then once I've got them flat, I, 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 I like, like to try to put a little of my, my love touch to it. And that's, you know, sort of something I just kind of came up with. I, you know, when I was building the, the, the locust tomato towers and fences, I like to round things off and make them soft and smooth and, you know, ease the edge a little. So this was kind of my idea of easing the edge by hand and not using a, a router that probably wouldn't have worked anyway because it's sort of like an odd shape. And this particular piece, where the pieces came together, it was sort of like an uneasy not so solid connection and I didn't want it to fall apart so I ended up getting a two foot drill and drilling all the way through this piece and joining it into the other solid piece and then I put a, two stainless steel bars through this particular piece and glued them together so that it 
it, it wouldn't fall apart. I love, there was a beautiful piece, and you're going to see why in a little bit, but um, that's sort of, uh, I'm not afraid to go to extreme lengths to make something work, because quite frankly, I was doing it for the fun of it, not so much for the financial uh, reward of it all. It was, a, it was sort of my, a passion. And I was doing it in the winter when I'm not busy with my landscaping. Uh, part of what I'm trying to accomplish is trying to take what the wood offers and add some cool features to it. And in this case, this was a rotten section that was all punky. And then I just chiseled it all out because I didn't want to have a punky section that was soft in the finish of the table. And I cleaned it all out and then I filled it up with resin to about a quarter inch and then I followed that with some crystal inlays, which you can see here. And I used red opal and turquoise. And then I filled the, the cracks and checks in the wood from the drying process with uh, blue lapis. So I have three types of crystals in this, this uh, piece. You know, in, in my travels, I've, I've sort of learned that everything around us has a frequency and a, a vibration. And there's a reason why healers over the years have used crystals because they have healing properties to them. They resonate frequencies that are, we don't really see, but we might feel. And turquoise, they say, makes you a little calmer. And, you know, so anyway, I thought it would be nice to add a little bit of energy to the piece, and I do, I do that with some, some crystals. Uh, this is an example of one of my more rustic pieces. It, it's really a pretty simple technique. I use a, a hand drill with a tenon cutter. And then I, I use uh, branches of wood. In this case, this was uh, a wood that insects had gotten into the, under the bark layer. And they had chewed little patterns in the, in the, in the branch. And I really thought that was neat, so I made legs out of them. And I, I drill a two-inch hole in the bottom of the piece, and then that's a, an inch and a half diameter tenon that's pretty much completely solid. So it's not necessarily the most complicated way to make a leg attachment. It's not a fancy dovetail or other mortise and tenon type connection square, but it's really strong. And that's what I'm trying to do. I don't think I have enough skill to really make those intricate ones anyway. The, probably the, the area that I excel the most at in, the, in my woodworking, from my perspective, is in the finished work. I grew up working on boats and detailing boats. So I, I gained a, a high appreciation for detail. And part of the finish process for me is filling all of the voids. So I do that with resins, and I fill all the cracks. And I don't know if anybody, I know there's one woodworker here, he'll probably agree with me that you can't just do it in one step because the resin will sink in and it will absorb into the cracks. So to, to fill all the voids in a piece like this, it takes about three or four applications of resin. And then you need to sand down, and then, then you can start applying the finish. So it's quite a long process just to fill the voids, especially when you're working with burrow wood, which tends to have more pores in it. And this is a burrow that was harvested in Cumberland, Maine, by a friend of mine who is also an artist, Denny Boudreau. He had these burls sitting in his barn for 20 years, and he didn't know what he was going to do with them. And I came by one day and said, hey, Denny, I'm looking for some interesting wood. Do you have any cool pieces? I know you collect wood. He's like, I got some burls. So he started feeling around in his garage. He, he doesn't have any eyesight anymore. He's pretty much 100% blind and started feeling around. He's like, oh, yeah, this is an oak burl. You'll love this. So I ended up leaving with a, a partial truckload of burls from Denny. And this was part of it. So this is, this is uh, 
a piece of wood that I got off of a log that is curly ambrosia maple. This tree was cut in South Portland and it was going to go to the dump and it was a giant log and the guy that I deal with for the wood called me and said, hey Ben, I've got this monster maple wood piece of wood. I'm going to take it to the dump. Do you think you might be interested? And I said, I said I'm really kind of only interested in the black locust. But, okay. He's like, I don't know, it could be kind of interesting. So he brought it over and I didn't know what I was getting into. And I sawed it up and I, sure enough, it was all curly, the whole log. Pretty much a miracle to be that lucky but I was that lucky and this was the top of the log piece and as soon as it came off the mill I knew exactly what I was going to make out of it. A coffee table because I could see the shape and I knew pretty much exactly what was going to be and this is what I this is what I created with that piece and it's a really pretty piece. The metal base was done by a, a friend of mine in Portland Jeff Hergerth who's a metal fabricator slash metal artist who has an, he's extremely talented and he's been really a pleasure to work with. I kind of told him what I wanted and he's exceeded my expectations. There's a top view of it and you can see the, the figure in it. It's highly figured. It's got a lot of curl and it also has a lot of the ambrosia coloration. This is the only piece I've made so far with the wood. I actually have another, I have a whole stack of the slabs that are all longer and wider than this. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably going to end up making countertops out of it or dining room tables. This is another piece that I made out of a scrap piece, top of the log cut. I was actually sawing this log with a friend of mine, Ethan Niederer, who is also a woodworker, uh, Grain, woodworking down in Portland. And he actually is the one that really got me into the, to finding the wood. He's, a, he's actually a tree climber. And he said, hey Ben, I want to saw up a log. I need someone to run the other side of the mill. I said, I'm all over it if you give me a piece. So I got one of the nice slabs out of this. But then I said, what are you doing with these top and bottom pieces? He said, firewood. And I said, I think, I think I got an idea for him. Can I take him? He's like, yep. And so that, there it is. And it, it's kind of a cool piece. I really like it. You can go ahead and switch to the next one. This is an inlay I did on that piece of turquoise through the whole crack. I basically just flipped it vertical and then taped both sides and tapped that turquoise in and then filled it with resin. It got a little bit expensive because the turquoise isn't that, isn't that cheap and it actually takes a lot to fill a crack like that. <laughs> this, is another, this is the other piece from that same log, which was the bottom, that I thought was really interesting because if you look, you can see there's a hole in the very middle of it and that's the bottom of it. I thought it had a neat shape. I actually thought the bottom might be more interesting than the top. And that was the piece that I made with that, with that slice. Um, you know, it, to me, it looks like a hammerhead shark if you look from the top, because it's got the mouth and the eyes. It's it's hard to see from this this angle, but if you look straight down on it, you can see the eyes and the. And I also did inlay work on that piece as well. There's Jeff in his shop. Um, you'll either find him at the shop or you're going to find him down at the Commercial Street Pub. But uh, he, he's a guy that I thought I worked a lot until I met Jeff. This was a Sunday, and he said, come in. I'm working on the, the bar top piece. Why don't you come in and take a look? And so I, I figured I'd take a picture of him in, in, doing his thing. He's, he's quite, quite the magician with the wood, or the metal, excuse me. There's the top view of the piece. So you can see the, the eyes here, the mouth, and the nose, and then the hand. So I think it looks like a hammerhead shark. But the nice thing about the wood is people will see whatever they want to see in it. You know, I'll see one thing, and then someone else will come along and see a, a monkey in it, or 
who knows what they'll see. But it, it's, it's really amazing the grain textures and how they, uh, they just appear to you and you see what you want to see in the piece. This was a piece of that walnut that I got from Hurricane Sandy. And it's actually, it was about three inches thick, which is actually pretty rare for a slab of wood of walnut. And then when it dried, it warped quite a bit. But I was able to, to get a net two inch finish out of this, which is actually pretty rare. You won't find a lot of walnut slab tables that are actually two inches thick. But this is a two inch thick piece of wood and I actually had this CNC flattened because I was really busy at the time and I didn't want to spend about six or seven hours, probably more, flattening it. So that I had this CNC flattened. He said he had it on the machine for like eight hours. <laughs> there's a top view of it. And you can see there's a little bit of figure to this piece as well. And I did an inlay, which I did before we had it flattened, which I probably shouldn't have done because it dulled the blade so much. And then on, on this angle, you can see there was a little void that was left after I had it milled or flattened and then I cut the radius. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll just stuff some more turquoise in there. And it actually worked out kind of neat. And when the light comes down through, it actually lights up from the sun. So it's really kind of neat how Sometimes the mistakes are the best. You get, you get some really interesting results. So this is, this is pretty much what I did in my first year. And this was all from the one log. Actually, it was one tree, four, about four logs. Of the tree uh, that I drove by on Cumberland Foreside and saw the butt ends of them. And I said, oh boy, I know exactly what I'm doing with that. I could see these tables and this is what I did and that's really what got me started and I, I produced all these in, in one off season and that's really what got me going on it. These pieces I was lucky enough to get into edge compotters in Portland and, and Booth Bay. They, they sell them there. This is a nice example of taking advantage of nature's work. This is where the ambrosia beetle chewed its way in. And it left a perfect little void for some color. And to me, it looks like a brain, but I don't know. Could be an alien brain, I don't know. Uh, that's the curly ambrosia maple. And that was a cool rustic bench that I made that I use for myself. And this is a, another piece of black locust. And I call this piece the ghost. It's hard to see from this angle, but I see an eye there and an eye here and a mouth and a tongue and, you know, the, the ghostly body. But, you know, again, you'll probably be able to see whatever you want to see in it. Another example of how nature's chaotic ways create an opportunity for the craftsman. The, the beetles chewed the, core, the heart of this piece out and I was able to fill it with a little bit of rock that I had in the backyard. I put a lot of black tourmaline in it, um, quartz, and then of course I used some other more exotic uh, crystals. I used the red, the red opal and some amethyst, a little touch of turquoise and Filled it all up with some, with some interest and I really like this piece and Jeff made the base for me, which is a little bit funky, but I really, I really like it. You can go ahead and click. This was another burl piece that I got from my friend Denny Boudreau, um, box elder burl. And it was cut in Cumberland Foreside. Denny was saving it to build sculpture with, and when he was feeling it, he's like, oh, I remember this piece. It was, you know, because it's real prickly. You can, you can see there's a little, I left a little bit of it when I cut, cut the circle. I left a little bit of that outside texture, 
And he said, oh, I never could quite figure out what to do with it. And I said, well, I think I can make some tables out of it. And that's what I did. And that's an example of how I left a little bit of the natural edge. I kind of think they look a little bit like globes, like earths, you know. And it's really quite interesting. See how porous it is. And that's actually after a lot of resin work. I just didn't do the final. I didn't do this. This isn't a wax, an oil wax finish. And the pieces over here are from the same burl wood. And those are uh, the Miracote epoxy finish. So those are, there's no porosity that's left in it. But you can see there's still a little bit in these. This is a piece of wood that I, I got from Lucas Tree Service as well. They had about a four foot section of it and I was driving through their yard and I said, what are you guys doing with that piece? And he said, Phew. he goes, I don't, he goes, this is our worst nightmare. I can't run that thing through the splitter. He's like, we're gonna have to take it to the dump. I said, well, I might be interested. And he's like, well, go get your trailer and we'll load you up. That's what I did and I, I brought it home and dumped it out and it flipped out and landed upright and I said, oh geez, thank God it didn't break anything. It's a white ash, it was a white ash tree. I later found out it was actually probably the biggest white ash that they had ever cut in Maine. This piece is about 47 inches in diameter. So it's pretty big and it's about five inches thick. Jeff did some wonderful work here. You know, I kind of came up with the design. I wanted it to be the radius. I really like the radiuses and the circles. And, and then Jeff made a little bit of a mistake with it. And he ended up, I had originally had this coming out of the top. And Jeff did it underneath. He called me up and said, why don't you come take a look? And I loved it. I thought it was absolutely amazing that, because it looks to me like the top grows out of the bottom and it's very organic looking. So that's what we went with. And uh, I mean, he's a real genius. It's all aluminum, so it's very light. So it's, um, it's I can, two people can pick the piece up, no problem, and move it around. But if I had made that out of steel, you know, it would have weighed probably twice as much as it does. And the nice thing about this piece, again, is it's, it's curly. This has a lot of curl to it, and you, you can usually tell if you have curly wood when you look at the cross cut and you see the wave pattern. That's how you can tell if you have, and if I, flat saw, if I had flats on this with, and made slabs, it would have all been the wavy figure. It was only four foot, a four foot slot, uh, chunk, so it wouldn't really made great tables, but, and I really was into cookies at the time, so I sawed them all up into cookies. Really hard to dry these without them making massive cracks. So I actually made a pile and I made, I made the stack in a big pile of coconut fiber that was dried. So the coconut fiber slowed down the dry rate, but it, the coconut fiber is extremely uh, hydrophilic, which is a, a term you use, to, it's like, it absorbs water extremely rapidly. Coconut fiber holds up to seven times its own weight in water. I use it for the mulch on my vegetable gardens. It's the byproduct of the coconut harvest. So they cut, they, they, I think there's like 32 products that come from a coconut. And one of them is the fibers. And the fibers are wonderful. They have incredible properties for growing food and vegetables. But I, I just kind of thought, hey, maybe I could slow down the whole drying process, but yet still dry them because I know the coconut's going to want to take water. So I stuck them in a big heap of coconut, coconut fiber for one year. And then I took them out and dried them the rest of the way. And geez, I barely got any cracks at all. And I did leave them six inches thick because I wanted them to have more meat so if they did crack they wouldn't break apart. The guy on the CNC machine ran the CNC machine for like 12 hours to make them four inches because I said I can't have it much more than four and a half inches thick. It would be just too heavy. So to get it down that much 
he put it on the machine for 12 hours. Luckily, you know, he sort of gave me the, the bro deal. <laughs> it wasn't that expensive, but to make a long story short, I brought it back into my shop and I started filling the little cracks. I was doing my early crack filling process. I put my first coat on, went inside, went out, went back about two hours later to check on it and it looked like a flying saucer. You know, those things you sit on when you go down, you know, the snow, those saucers. It cupped about an inch and a half and I about lost it. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Huh. So I thought about it. I let it sit. I went to bed. I got up the next day and I said, oh, I think I, think I could just fill it with resin and make it flat again. And I'll make that the bottom. And then I can route the top to make it flat. So whew, about 300 bucks later in resin, it was flat. And about three weeks of, you know, because you can't just pour an inch and a half of resin without getting bubbles. I mean, I'm kind of weird. I, you know, I like it to be, I'm, you know, I'm striving for perf perfection. I know it doesn't exist. At least that's what they tell you in school. But I try to make things as perfect as possible. I didn't even want air bubbles in the bottom of my piece, just in case someone looked at it. So I did a little pour, let it harden, did another pour. Anyway, I eventually got it flat, flipped it over, put the resin on the other side, and whoosh, the other side cupped. So I did the same thing. And it's flat as a pancake now. And there's nothing getting through it because it's got resin all the way around it and every, you know, it's, it's pretty much completely packed. So if you want to do this kind of stuff, you got to be super patient because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And if you want it to be good and look pretty much perfect, you're going to have to try and try and try to get that finish. Unless you have a dedicated finish room, which I don't, you really need to um, be patient. There's a side profile, and again, this has that insect pattern in the, in the cambium layer, and it's, it's sort of neat. I try to leave it. And the, the burl pieces I got from Denny I used for the, the stools, and I've got pretty lucky, I think, because um, the set I'm calling the vortices pieces, uh, the vortices, or vortexes, and if you look at this bar stool, it's pretty much a perfect vortex. And if, if you were to look outside at the galaxies, they're vortexes. If you, if you look at the DNA spiral, it's a vortex. If you look at a black hole, it's a vortex. Pretty much the scientific beliefs that people are coming to the conclusions now that vortexes are actually black holes. So, that's pretty much a black hole. But it's really neat how nature works this way. And it's actually the abnormalities or the, or the um, what is the term I want to use? The mutations that are the most interesting. The burls, the figure, the stresses that the wood goes through makes it more beautiful. And really, I honestly think that people are the same way. The more hard knocks you go through, the more tolerant you become, the more understanding you become of the way the world works and how nature works in an order to chaos state. It's constantly moving in the fluctuation between those two states, just like our lives. So when I'm making furniture, some days everything works great and everything's coming to order and then I can come back out the next day and the piece is warped like crazy and it's all chaotic again. But if you just relax and take a few deep breaths, you can bring it right back into order again. Another cool example of Jeff's metal work and you know, I'm, I feel really lucky to have him on my, on my team to help me make these pieces more beautiful. So, thank you all for coming. There's an example of
perfection. Um, yeah, and so you've mentioned Burl several times. Yeah. Could you just talk a little bit about what a Burl actually is? Like how come it looks that way? What is that? Right. So a Burl is basically a mutation. And it's a, it's... When you say mutation, like so a tree is growing... A, a, it's like a canker that grows on the side of a tree. So those lumpy bits. It's that... So if you look at a tree and you see a big lump on the side of it, that's a Burl. So it's probably going to be from an environmental stress that the tree went through. Maybe someone dinged it or um, the, you know, it got damaged in that particular area or, or it just became like a, a wart. It's like a wart on our skin. It's a mutation that, I mean, probably in the unexplained category because, you know, if you look at the cross section of it, it's a vortex. So, who knows what it really is? <laughs> it's interesting, though. I think they're absolutely beautiful. And they're, if you look at it on the outside of the tree and you see a tree with burl everywhere, you might think it's the ugliest tree you've ever seen. But actually, when you slice into it, it will be filled with not just three dimensions, maybe 10 dimensions, 10, 20 dimensions. If you cut it on, you could cut it on 20 different angles and it would look different in every angle. So it's, it's quite amazing and we're not even capable of understanding it, I don't think. I'm not. <laughs> right, so ordinarily, so when you talk about curly patterns inside right. the tree, that's different? That's yeah, well, so like a curl, trees. right, the cur like a curly pattern, it's usually found in older trees from my understanding and as the wind blows, the trees develop ripples in reinforcing structure to keep them upright. And you often see like a br if a branch comes out on a really weird angle, like a really flat 90 degree angle relative to the ground, and they spread out a long distance away to get light, on the underside of that branch you're going to see a lot of rippling, which is curl. It'll show up as ripples in the wood. And it's really just the tree reinforcing itself from the environmental stresses. So it's architectural. It's architectural. It's structural. It's structural. And, and it's funny because um, like if, you, if you do any homework on figured wood, you're going to find that a lot of the times the, mus the musical instruments are made with figured wood. They're called tone woods because they actually resonate sound differently than regular wood. It's that whole frequency thing. So with that curl pattern, it actually changes how that wood resonates sound. Fantastic. And so I feel like as, over the course of your talk, we started out with some gardens, right. and then we moved in, and then by the end it was all tables and chairs. Yeah, I got kind of lost there. Well, no, so, it, so when we spoke briefly on the phone, it sounded, and it came out as you were speaking, that your, your furniture work really did kind of grow out of yeah. your gardening work. So living things and then using ex-living things to make um, your furniture. Right. I, I, I was working with wood in my landscaping work, and, you know, as a landscaper, I do a lot of pruning work, and I, you know, I sort of shape landscapes and I prune trees and shrubs and you know and as you drive around and you're in that flow oftentimes I see wood and I see blown down trees or I see tree guys cutting down trees and I just sort of have been drawn to it and I've realized that you know I'm in a I'm in a field where I can actually find really nice wood through my work and being out there and about in the landscaping and that's how I've come across a lot of this beautiful wood Fantastic. in my daily work yeah. as a landscaper. <laughs> wow. And it's really also really, as a, as a landscaper in Maine, it's a short season. So you need something to do besides plow snow, which only happens 12 times a winter. So there's a lot of free time. You know, I like to surf, as you can see here. You know, this is, this was, this is my idea of a perfect day. You know, a double rainbow and nice two-foot-high thigh glassy waves. So, you know, you can only find, you know, I needed something to do in my 
spare time. I do a lot better when I'm busy than if I'm sitting around and dwelling on how slow it is and you know all the problems I have. If I'm if I'm whittling away at wood, I'm all my problems go away, and I'd really just get really hyper focused. It's a really fascinating element. I feel like this is something that has come up as several makers have come through and talked about their work. That that um, that ability to sit down and focus to sort of shrink the world down to your work, and yes. then but at the same time really engage completely like in this uh, sort of amazing tangible way with one element inside the world that this is one of the reasons that many makers make stuff. Yes, I, and that's why I think I would do what I do is because if I look at the big picture, I oftentimes get, get a little overwhelmed with it all and I'm, I feel like, oh geez, you know, I can't do anything, right? But when I have a piece of wood in front of me or let's just say it's a whole garden bed with a million weeds in it. If I just take it one weed at a time, it's no problem. Bef in two hours, all the weeds are gone. And, you know, it's, it's like, it's amazing. When you, when you look at one thing around you and focus on it, you can accomplish it. But it's sort of overwhelming if you look at all the, you know, everything around us and how messed, you know, how messed up everything really is. Wow, well, um, shall we? I, I don't know if I'm going to I got a couple questions cool. that relate to uh, your, your cookie cutter. So I, I yes. wanted to know two things. There's one about the cutting of the cookie itself yes. and how that's performed. Yes. It seems like I know you're doing some adjustments with the router, which is the second right. part of it. But you want to minimize see. those. Right. That amount of so how are, you, how are you actually cutting these cookies? So um, you have to have a, so it depends, you know, a smaller cookie, right. I'll use a smaller chainsaw bar. A bigger cookie, you need a big chainsaw bar. Okay, so it's all, it's all So you have a bar, you need a bar that's big enough to slice through the whole cookie. And then what you need to do is when you go to slice that cookie, you got to get yourself centered to the universe, as I say. Yeah. You got to find your center your core, you know, you got to get your core central, centered, and then you need to let sort of like eye your bar. Yeah. I'll, what I do is I'll oftentimes I'll take and take a tape measure, and if I want, I usually make my cookies about four inches thick, that way they're thick enough so if they crack they don't fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, t I'll measure four inches and then I'll go down, I'll go around the log to my visual plane, and I'll yeah. make a dot with a sharpie, yeah. and then I'll stand up over it and I'll sort of eye that bar and you know just like shooting a gun yeah. you you kind of sight it yeah. and then drop it in once you drop in you're you're committed you got to yeah. just go it's done. Yeah. so it's really just you know doing a lot of cutting yeah. you yeah. get yeah. better yeah. at it so i've gotten to the point now where i might only be like a quarter inch or a half inch off on a cookie yeah. which turn you know and then what i do is i i have a big um hand planer it's actually a power hand plane. It's a Makita, it's like a six and a half inch thick, yeah. six and a half inch wide, you probably know the planer. Yeah. You do. I do. It's a beast. It's a beast, let me tell you. So I'll rough it out with, a, with that first mm -hmm. because it's quick. And then once I get it almost flat, to get it perfectly flat, I run it through the router. So I'm not, I don't wanna have to spend six hours routing a piece. <laughs> so I, I go with the planer. It's a little bit of a burly job because it's dangerous and it's heavy and it's, you know, you're, it's, it's, you know, the piece weighs a lot, but it speeds the process up. So the second part of the question then relates to the router and yeah. really the blades. I mean, you're spinning this blade for a, a, a million right. passes, you know, and, right. and, and uh, so, um, are you sharpening your, your blades? So, you, the, the blades I use are um, carbide tipped. And I have a router bit that's like a fly cutter. And the, the blades actually attach to the fly cutter with a little hex nut. And then you, the, the carbide blades you can rotate once. So you have basically it's like having two router bits in one and then 
you just replace those little blades, not the fly cutter. And then you can send those back to get sharpened. So it's actually relatively inexpensive. Although, you know, it really starts to add up when you really do the math. Especially sandpaper and stuff. You know, like if I go, if I'm doing the epoxy resin finish, I'm so particular about it that, you know, I don't just get it done in the second coat. If it's not perfect, I'm going to do it again. So then I got to go sand every, so I might use 50 pieces of sandpaper on one set of tables, you know, and then, you know, the drill bits and the router bits, and, you know, and the time, it's just, if I log every hour, it's like, it gets a little bit crazy. Of course, you know, I'm not really as fast as I could be. I'll probably, get, probably going to get a lot faster as I do more of it so that it, it's going to be a little bit more affordable if, if I want to charge a, a a, a rate that I can actually make a little profit on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's tricky. It's a tricky balance. But again, I, I, this is more out of passion, not so much out of dollar, you know, thinking dollar signs. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I love them, so I'm not just going to sell them cheap because I'd just soon have them next to my bed, you know? So. So that's my <laughs> question. How, how, uh, how do you sell this stuff? I mean, well, you they, market they, via yeah. I haven't really gotten to that point because I'm, you know, I, I'm so busy making and stuff that I really don't have a lot of time to focus on this. A lot of, it's funny, like, a lot of my friends and family, they're like, where are you going to sell them? And I'll say, I don't know, I hadn't even thought of that. Well, you, you know, you need to sell them. I'm like, not really. I kind of like them. I think they're like most artists. So. They're like, you know, everybody, you know, as an artist, you're not really, really too worried about selling them, but all your friends see all the time you put in and they think, oh, geez, you better start making some money on that or else it's not sustainable. So, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, to get into Edgecombe Potters here in Portland, and then they also have them at the store in Edgecombe. They're not really selling a whole lot of them yet, but um, they've sold some stomp pieces I did, and, you know, I... I I'm going to have a gallery at my, my house in Yarmouth. Um, I'm in the process of renovating an 1860s farmhouse, which has a 35 by 40 foot, foot uh, timber frame barn. And I'm going to make that my new workshop instead of a two car garage. <laughs> and that, that'll have an area in it where I can have my furniture. And it's in a really nice location. So, you know, ideally I'd like to sell direct to the people so that I don't have to, the, the galleries often will you know, double ed or whatever, they have to make their margin. So it gets a little bit of ex 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 exorbitant. Yeah. Any further questions? Things we should talk about? When you talk about the resin that you use, yes. did you say the West System epoxy? Is that basically it? So I started with the West System um, to fill the cracks, and then I would follow it up with varnish. So the piece in front of me here, the one that the computer's sitting on, that, that's a varnished piece, and I'm using, um, I did West Systems to fill all the voids. And then I varnished it, and I did about 30 coats of varnish. The table that comes. Right. I used bar top. I used the Systems 3 Miracoat. Was that in the August? Was it really humid when that happened, when it cooked? No, it was in the dead of the winter and it was in a heated garage. But it's just, you know, when you're dealing with the end grain and the, the like straws, so it sucked in the moist, the, just the resin moisture made it happen. And would it have been, could you have avoided that if you got the bottom, uh, did the top, and then let's see, do the bottom and then flip it over and then do the top? Right, right that's the pretty much what I've learned is that, and I've changed my system. Now I'm doing a, a viscous, Systems 3 penetrating epoxy, which waterproofs it. I do three coats of the Systems 3 penetrating epoxy, waterproofs the entire surface. It's super viscous, so it sinks in faster, better absorption. Then I follow it up with the, either the mirror coat or the varnish. And if I do 12 coats of varnish over that, it looks like I did 30. Because when I did like that walnut piece, it's, it's varnished, it looks like it has 30, 40 coats of varnish on, and I only did like 12. Still a lot, <laughs> but, you know, 
look what it looks like when it's done. I mean, it's, it's worth it. Plus, you know, it, again, it's really hard to lay down that perfect coat. So I polished that piece and went to 6,000 grit. So it looks like it's like glass. You know, it has, you know that's, this is in its second year. They look better as they get older, actually. I think it probably, the varnish hardens even more. Now, epoxy, when I've been around epoxy, it stinks. Yes. It's so are you concerned, like, how do you manage toxicity and... So that's the, yeah. So I wear a full white Tyvek, because I, I get really itchy easy with that. I don't like it, because when I worked on boats, I used to do the bottoms, you know, and I did... And I did all the wax jobs and the acetone, cleaned all, did all, I worked with a lot of toxins as a kid and I never had any protective gear. So I'm really kind of sensitive to it now. So I wear a full face respirator and I wear the full hooded uh, suit. You know, I, I, I'm an organic gardener, so I really am pretty careful about how I, what kind of toxins I use and I want to be as sustainable as possible. There's quite a bit of waste that goes into doing resin work because you can't really save containers or brushes. But once you make a piece with that finish, it's literally never going to degrade. It's 100% encapsulated on all four sides. You could throw that thing in the ocean and it probably wouldn't take on water. So from a sustainability standpoint, it's a given a take in that area. It makes the grain really pop too, which is really, I like that look. You can, you know, really bang stuff on the wood and it's really hard, you know. You, so there's a lot of benefits, there are some drawbacks. But I like, you know, I wanted to show people three or four different looks. Mm -hmm. So I went with the oil finish with the wax oil wax finish that's sort of the most natural and then I went with a, a linseed oil varnish which is a really natural varnish with no VOCs with the varnish and then I went with the super high-tech epoxy so I've got you know three things kind of going and I've experimented with I like all three you know the varnish and the epoxy are definitely a lot more um, material intensive the oil is actually more time intensive because you have to let the oil dry so much you know you have to let it dry before you you know and I, I don't want just one coat of oil I gotta put like 15 or 10 or you know and then I gotta wax it three times so you know it, it take like six months to get an, a proper oil finish and then it needs to really be re-oiled by the homeowner or re-oil waxed periodically. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I wonder if this is a good moment for a round of applause. Thank you so much.